My name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. And today we are having a conversation about the Sony Pictures Entertainment Catalog. Of course, Sony has a, a venerable, illustrious uh, catalog of movies that uh, range back from practically when cinema uh, first began. Uh, today, for today's purposes, we've assembled uh, three AFCA members, uh, Lisa Kennedy out of Denver, Rhonda Rasha Penrise out of Atlanta, and Edward Adams also out of Atlanta to talk about some important titles as it relates to their African-American content. For the purposes of identifying the movies that we're talking about, um, they are Buck and the Preacher, Poetic Justice, School Days, which Lisa Kennedy uh, was responsible for, Higher Learning, Devil in a Blue Dress, and To Serve with Love, which Rhonda Rasha Penrise took a look at, and also Baby Boy, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and Stir Crazy, which Ed Adams uh, uh, handled. Why are these films important? Well, I think they're important because they're still excellent films. And that's one of the things that struck me the most is in watching each of my particular titles, they have such great relevance now. The filmmaking still stands up, especially when you think about um, Carl Franklin's The Devil in a Blue Dress is such a unique film. And we haven't really seen as many um, noir films done with a predominantly black cast. And so that's an interesting thing. When you watch Higher Learning, I just couldn't help but be struck by the timeliness of it all still. You have a conversation about monuments. Um, we're going through that now, like talking about the significance of going to a school as a person, a black person at a school called Columbus. And as you know, Columbus statues have been tumbling all over the country. So that was interesting. Also, this whole concept of the white supremacist groups and the alt-right, we're dealing with that now. And I just thought, wow, you know, John Singleton gets credit for a lot of his films, but people kind of forget about higher learning. And right now, that's probably one of the most timeliest films that um, he made. Yeah, I was thinking about my films and kind of resonating something that what Rhonda was saying is that, yeah, I mean, I think that it, they do, like when I think about like something like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and we think about identity politics, you know, that kind of resonates in the same way we would think about something like Baby Boy and how we talk about, you know, where we are right now, especially with all the, the, the violence that we're seeing with like, cops against black men and identity and who they are and what they represent and the, the perceptions that we see that John Singleton tends to challenge in this film. And then, um, and even when thinking with Stir Crazy, when we talk about just how the prison system or the criminal justice system kind of looks at the perception of what these people had done, you know, and, and how the system treated them, right? Whether you were being judged by the, you know, by the judge or being taken into the prison system, that perception of what that actually looks like and how they seem to navigate through it. Yeah, it's funny. One of the things I really loved about, I mean, first of all, School Days, I just think, is it's not like it's overlooked as a Spike movie, but I think people just don't, re I mean, besides being so much fun, he is taking on everything. I mean, it is like sort of all there in one movie on one campus. Every tension, every like, you know, sort of style of person. I mean, there's just, it's, you know, we're always, always wanting, I think, to have just the broadest, most interesting um, textured view of like, quote unquote, the community. And then so many people are represented in such textured ways in this movie in such fun ways. I think it's an, I think it's extraordinary, but so that, so that confident, you know, and of course, you know, now that we have the word woke, it's just like, oh my gosh, how long ago was like, wake up. And I actually think wake up is so much more vital than like the notion of being quote unquote woke. Then there's something really active about what happens at the end of that movie that I think we can all continue to learn from. One of the things I thought was amazing though about Buck and the Preacher, which I hadn't seen before. I mean, I'd like seen lots of Westerns and I hadn't seen Buck and the Preacher and I loved it. 
And I loved it because there's like these BIPOC moments that no one necessarily expected. And I'm just like, oh, that's that's Poitier. I mean, that's like, I think that if that, if John Sargent left that um, shoot in that production to some degree, um, not good riddance, but great, because what gets, what comes there are these people that are just these performers that I think are super aware of the nuance of the relationships. And when this was made in the 70s, there was a lot of conversations about indigenous people, about Native Americans and, and the AIM movement and everything, but it gets articulated in this movie and some scenes that were really surprising and felt so up to the moment in a way. So that was extraordinary. Okay, we're gonna watch um, a scene from School Days. Wow, incredible. You know, all I could think of was how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> or how young La Lawrence is. Right? right, looking at them and going, oh my God, this is like, you know, a hundred years ago. This was obviously a standout movie and this is a standout scene in that film. Why has it remained that way for so long? I mean, people are still talking about this particular scene in School Days about its impact, about the statement that it makes or that it should be making to our community in particular? I think there's a couple of things that happened. First of all, just stylistically, it, it's, it's kind of 
operetta. It's like an area. And I mean, you know, an aria in some way. It's crazy. It's just like him running through the campus to the thing. It's He does so much in that. And it's really unusual. There's something else going on. So it's not just that it's a statement. It's not just that it's engaging the community. It is actually sort of visually doing something um, profound in that it it is a little operatic. The wake up, the like, the close ups of the wake up, like, you know, you see Lawrence Fishburne's teeth, you know, Dap his teeth. And then there's like Big Brother Almighty and Dap looking at each other and looking like they're almost going to kiss. I'm serious. I, they're, I don't even know why I'm, I'm not even projecting. It really does look like that. It's like that's how much the reproach, you know, the reprochement is, is that it's about love. And I just think that that part of it, so one of the ways scenes become iconic and they remain absolutely in our, um, our sort of canon of great images and why something sticks with us is because of like the com combination of the style, the choice, the filmic choices that are unusual and also what's going on in terms of the storytelling, right? It's like crap, you know, that homecoming weekend was all over the place. Everybody's exhausted. I mean, by the way, Spike puts his sister in a like red onesie. I think that is hilarious. <laughs> oh my God, it's like what's John doing in a red onesie? Right on, man. And, uh, but, um, but I think, you know, so much has happened that weekend, right? But the last thing that happens before this is just like, you know, half pint, Spike's character coming to Dap and sort of bragging that he's not a virgin anymore. And and how he's not a virgin happened because of something so hideous ultimately. And so there's like a reckoning that's going on in that on that moment. And that's where that's what the that's what prompts Dap to be like, wake up. It's like this is not okay. We are not in an okay place. And I think that we need to be reminded as a community, part of the reason that works is because as a community, it's easy to get into a not okay place with each other and that you are like then forced to sort of have a reckoning and to like wake up and be, and to see yourselves as a reason to be together. It's interesting during that time because, and I remember watching school days and people being utterly confused by the ending of it. And so to come over 30 years later and see that people have caught up with spite because at the time it was like, what kind of ending is this? What is this supposed to mean? And I think today we get exactly what it means. And one of the interesting things a few years ago for the 30th anniversary, I was able to um, interview Spike because he had a 30th anniversary um, screening at the Fox Theater, which is historic here in Atlanta. And that whole situation was so crazy because all of HBCU folks and the Divine Nine, they were in their school colors. They were referring their sororities, fraternities. And my friend who came with me had was, is younger and had never seen school days on the big screen. And it literally blew him away because, you know, the I don't think that we appreciate the pageantry of this. And I know that Spike Lee had said that he is working on a musical version of this. And I just cannot wait, you know, when we reopen, of course, to see what this will look like on the Broadway stage, because I think it will just be incredible. It's been a minute since I've seen School Days. Um, I think I was in school when this actually was coming out. But um, one of the things I thought was interesting watching the scene again was, um, this idea of the wake up scene and how he caught them at a moment where they didn't, and anybody who's been to an HBCU, you know, you don't walk out that door unless you are put together. And I thought it was kind of interesting that he caught them at a moment where they couldn't become this alter ego of themselves. They had to look at each other for who they really were in that moment. And they all just kind of watched each other for the first time, like they'd never seen each other before. And I thought that was a very kind of powerful statement to put into the scene. Um, and then, and even just watching people wake up and how they were not prepared for what was about to happen, but they, they went along with it anyway. I thought it was kind of an interesting thing to watch. Great, thanks you guys. We're gonna now take a look at Devil in a Blue Dress. But all the way home, all I could think about was a chance to make some money. I first came out to Los Angeles when I got home from the war in Europe. With $300 in my pocket, 
and the GI Bill. Like me, a lot of colored folk from Texas and Louisiana had moved out to California to get them good jobs in the shipyards and in the aircraft companies. Hey, we're late. Now, me, myself, I was a machinist. And the first thing I did when I saved enough money was to buy me a house. Man, I love coming home to my house. I don't know. I guess maybe I just loved owning something. Wow, that's amazing. That almost reminds me of my family story because that's how my dad got to LA because of those. I mean, it was either pick sugarcane in Louisiana or uh, go to LA and work on the sea docks. But Rhonda, that was a standout for you. Um, why? Well, it's a standout for me because I am a history buff. And also, I've always been fascinating, fascinated by migration because my mom, my aunt migrated from Mississippi to Chicago. And that's a very um, personal kind of narrative to me. But having lived in Los Angeles and knowing the richness of the Black Louisiana and um, Black Texas community, I thought that it was very poignant for Carl Franklin to include that because a lot of people are very unaware of the history of LA and how a lot of people got to be there. And it, there's a lot of things that kind of explain um, why um, Easy does the things that he um, does. That um, you understand that you were being told that this was a better place, but it was just a different manifestation of racism. It wasn't as in your face and people didn't tell you directly, but they still kept you in boxes. And then the concept of the broken, well, not even the concept, the reality of the country's broken promise to black veterans. And that's all in this clip, we see all of that history. And it's very important, especially in the sequence of things um, to think about the Watts riots and to think about the LA riots. And a lot of it is rooted in this history. I love that you said that about migration, Rhonda, because it's like my family's the like LA to LA, the Louisiana to LA uh, migration. And I love that one. And, you know, and, and to see it in this film, and I didn't remember it as well at all. Uh, and I like this film a lot, but it's just like, you know, it's in Charles Burnett a lot. So, you know, just as a thing, but I think you're right. And I, I like that you also situated that in the sort of broken promise of the post-war um, GI Bill and stuff like that. It's really interesting because Los Angeles does have such an amazing history on screen, but sometimes tries to evade its history on screen. I mean, it's actual history as a place on screen to sort of replace it with a, and so that something like this has a sense of place, even though it's a genre movie. And, you know, I just feel sad. I always felt kind of frustrated that this didn't become kind of a franchise, right? I mean, this is like sort of a natural franchise in some way. That's what it should have been. Um, and I imagine that was its intention potentially. So that's always a frustration, but I love what you said about the migration. Um, getting reflected. Yeah, I agree. I thought it was interesting, even just watching that clip again, to just kind of see what, what Black Americana looked like and how glossy it was. It was kids playing in the yard, people talking to their parents, you know, men driving nice, clean cars, being happy to pull into their driveway. The American dream and the realization of it, or even a perception of it all was there. And I thought that was kind of a clever thing to think about. Um, I love how stylized this movie is. That's one of the things I think about as far as like, what film noir goes. I mean, it's, it's, it has the patina that you expect a film noir to be, but yet to see black people in it just kind of makes it even better, makes it glossier, makes it prettier to me. And I just kind of really fell in love with that part of it. And then finally, we are going to uh, watch, you know, uh, Guess Who's Coming uh, to Dinner, which uh, from Stanley Kramer and which, um, you know, again, it's a movie that sort of uh, symbolizes uh, a movement that was taking place in the country uh, at that time, the whole idea of interracial uh, courtships and marriages. As for you two and the problems you're going to have, they seem almost unimaginable. But you'll have no problem with me. And I think that uh, when Christina and I and your mother have some time to work on him. 
you will have no problem with your father, John. But you do know, I'm sure you know, what you're up against. There will be a hundred million people right here in this country who will be shocked and offended and appalled at the two of you. And the two of you will just have to ride that out, maybe every day for the rest of your lives. You can try to ignore those people, or you can feel sorry for them and for their prejudices and their bigotry and their blind hatreds and stupid fears. But for necessary, you'll just have to cling tight to each other and say, screw all those people. Anybody could make a case, and a hell of a good case, against your getting married. The arguments are so obvious that nobody has to make them. But you're two wonderful people who happen to fall in love and happen to have a pigmentation problem. And I think that now, no matter what kind of a case some bastard could make against your getting married, there would be only one thing worse. And that would be if, knowing what you two are, knowing what you two have, and knowing what you two feel, you didn't get married. Well, that was so powerful, kind of almost the passing of the torch moment, one great actor passing off you know, to an, another actor who was about to uh, forever be uh, uh, enshrined, you know, in uh, cinematic history with Mr. Portier. I mean, this film, is, is this still an issue uh, for the culture? It, the idea of interracial relationships and marriages? I think that when you think about that speech, it speaks towards the sentiment that we have on both sides of that table, right? Um, I mean, just kind of, just to put in context, I mean, we're right at the, this film came out right at the eve of loving, the, the Supreme Court's decision over loving versus Virginia, you know, where they're striking down these rules that are saying that inter, uh, interracial uh, marriages cannot take place. Um, and then we're also seeing a cultural shift in the country, right? Um, I, I think that, yeah, when you think, to this day, we still have conversations about race and interracial and interracial relationships, whether it's black or white, or you know, black and other people of color, white and other people of color. Um, there are still side eyes. There's still conversations that we're still having to this day, absolutely. But I think the thing that's really powerful about this movie is that there have been interracial relationships or interracial stories that would happen in the past. I mean, Black Sydney Poitier had done one and he did the night the same year, um, but. You know, this movie was hopeful. This was about a time in 1967 where we were looking for change. And this movie kind of ushered in a conversation about change that we hadn't seen about this particular topic. And it got kind of, it got a couple of, uh, you know, uh, weird conversations in a lot of critic reviews because I don't think people really opened to it. They thought it was kind of um, peddling, you know, it's kind of peddling to this kind of base narrative. But the reality of it is that I think that the, the conversation that the director wanted to have and what the actors wanted to accomplish was done really beautifully. And it, it still kind of holds up because it's still kind of funny. The, the comedy, especially, you know, thinking about like Isabel uh, Stanford as Tilly, all of her conversations sound like my mom if I were to bring a white girl home. You know, that would be the conversation she'd be having with me to this day. And I think that does resonate. I think the other thing that's sort of prophetic is that idea that, you know, we're, we're watching Spencer Tracy's character give that speech, but he was the one who really had to have a kind of come to Jesus moment. He was really, he was a great example of that kind of moderate that, you know, sort of does all the like, you know, all the lip service, but then when he had to like face the reality of his family's composition changing, he was having some problems and he tried to deflect those problems on the other reasons, right? The culture's going to do this, the blah, blah, blah. But they were like things that he had to get over. The funny thing is, I, I mean, a million years ago now, I used um, 
guess who's coming to dinner to like engage my parents about me coming out because my parents have been really progressive. My dad's a psychologist so he's passed away now, but they have been pretty progressive about every kind of person really open about people. Right. We had these conversations about gay people that he was like, you know, that were in the counseling center and he wasn't making that a problem. He was talking about, you know, people's human, you know, struggles in a way and in a very compassionate way, but they were not having it. And I was just like, I remember coming back from Denver to go to college and I was just steaming. And I realized part of it was just that they had raised me oddly sort of to have this expectation of fairness and that they would like still love me. And I challenged it by, you know, coming out and it was, and it was an interesting moment. So I really have a very special place in this, you know, in my heart for this film, but I think this film's amazing. And I think the funny thing is it holds up as, as acron anachronistic as it sometimes seems, it also holds up at different places at different times. Like I know there were all these conversations to some degree about Sidney Poitier's character and not like, you know, and how sort of upstanding and tight he was. But when he gets angry, you know, that guy, that actor pulls off that fury and steaming anger in a way that I see almost a direct descendant in Denzel and things, right? Like when he's in glory, it's like, there's something about that kind of coiled, frustration that feels so deeply in tune with what it can be like to be a black, what I assume, what it can be like to be a black man in this country facing like nonsense, you know, to be nice, right? Nonsense to be nice, not just abject racism. So I think there's so much that holds up. And I think there's ways that we get to come back to it and say, well, actually, it too was kind of visionary in some ways, you know, people were kind of shrugging it off that wanted a certain kind of politics, but it actually speaks to something very profound about um, that kind of middle of the roadism and what is, where is the middle of the road and can it move and what are, what are the challenges, both emotional and cultural? So I, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this film, even today. One of the things that Lisa talks about is, you know, one of the issues was they felt that this film in the, at the time revealed the hypocrisy of the liberal community and that you are you kind of are supporting black civil rights um, in general or as an idea. But if a black man were to come home with your daughter, like how liberal are you really? And that was a conversation that was sparked in that time. So you're spot on, Lisa, to point to that. And what I love about what Ed said was that he would still, his mother would still have that Tilly conversation. So a lot of like, you know, change is just really interesting because it does come down to like, who's in your family? Who are your real, you know, who are your friends? Because friends are like a, you know, a horizontal relationship, presumably not a sort of top down relationship. So it's not, it's not enough that this family, you know, that Tilly is respected in that family and seems sort of, you know, like, you know, a member of the household in this sort of uncomfortable way. It really is just like, oh, you know, when your daughter comes home with the most upstanding black men, <laughs> you know, can you deal with that? And the answer was, uh, it's going to take us a while. That's pretty, that's pretty rich. One of the things that really stands out, especially with this film, or what makes it work for me, is that every single conversation was had. You know, you have the mothers talking to the mothers, the fathers talking to the fathers, the fathers talking to the son. You know, it was just so many conversations that every thought that you would think that you would have about that particular topic got aired out in some way, shape or form. Even like when the Monks Jr. kind of jumps in and tries to kind of break down, you know, Matt's, you know, his hard shell. But one of my favorite moments um, was really when the two fathers talk, you know, and what you got was this fear, the fear for the daughter and the fear for the son, which you never really had that conversation because you would think that, you know, granted that, um, I'm trying to think, yeah, Roy Glenn, uh, you know, he's, he's proud of Sidney Poitier's character. He's proud of everything that he's accomplished. And he feels like he's about to throw it all away by jumping into this relationship with this girl. And then you have, on the opposite side of that same conversation, you have, you know, Spencer Tracy's Matt saying, my daughter has so much promise. And look what she's about to get herself into. And for the first time, you see, like, these fathers, these patriarchs worried about the fear for their children which the mothers had none of. They were so promised and hopeful that this was going to work out, even though they knew they were going up a lot, going up a lot, going up against a lot of opposition and when the way up the state of the world is right now. But it was just a really interesting moment. I think to me that stands out as one of the best moments. But again, that ending scene when, you know, when Matt sits down with the family and tells them, this is what you're up against, but we all support you eventually. Um, Roy Glenn's face 
pouting still at the end still makes me laugh. It's like, yeah, I'm still not down with this. <laughs> Thank you everybody for your participation today. I think uh, you get, you're giving people a, a lot of inspiration to go out and watch these movies again, or if they haven't seen them to become familiar with them uh, at the very least. This video along with the trailer and clips can be found on the Sony Pictures Entertainment YouTube channel. On behalf of the world's largest group of African-American critics, I'd like to thank you and enjoy watching movies.